My name is Andrew Bustamante, and this is Everyday Espionage. When we last left my wife, Jihi, she had just discussed a cognitive distortion, a type of mental barrier known as black and white thinking. Black and white thinking is a mental habit that we develop as children when parents try to help us define our world using absolutes, like good and bad, or safe and unsafe, healthy or unhealthy. Jihi talked about how the distortion of absolutes that black or white thinking that she developed as a child and all through college, and even during her social work career, was shattered when she joined CIA. Because instead of a black or white world, what she discovered was that our world is much more colorful. It's full of options and opportunities that she never realized existed. One of the things that you and I often talk about is how the mind works, the cognitive realities that exist in our mind and how those play into our everyday life. We just talked about cognitive distortions, but there's also things like cognitive biases. There's also things like uh, cognitive dissonance. Where, where do you see in your life cognitive challenges being a major either roadblock or a major burden? That's an interesting question. <laughs> That's a good stalling answer. Yeah. <laughs> I've been, I'm taking notes from the politicians. That's a, that's a good question, Andy. Let me answer that for you. You know, there was once this thing that I did. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's distract. Red herring moment. Red herring, exactly. <laughs> so I can, tell, I can tell just by looking at you, the audience doesn't get a chance to look at you. I can tell by looking at you, you're deciding how personal to go with the question. Yes. So I would say, you know, follow your instinct, but I, there's nothing that we need to hide because the people listening are all coming from everyday lives. And that's exactly the question that we're trying to answer. Where do you find your experience in cognitive conditioning? Where do you find that it impacts us the most in our everyday life? I think that I would guess that most people throughout their life's journey have periods of self-reflection and change over time because of those periods of self-reflection uh, combined with the experiences they're having, where they want to go, the goals they're trying to meet. When I started with the agency, it was actually when I was applying to the agency. Six months before I moved to D.C., I got really sick. And I went to doctor after doctor, and I couldn't figure out what it was. And then within the first two weeks of my move to D.C., right before I started working at CIA, I ended up in the emergency room, really sick. And the emergency room doctor, and for the life of me, I wish I could remember his name because he was amazing, kept asking me questions about stress. And he kept asking me, are you, are you under stress? I said, of course I'm under stress. Everybody's under stress. When aren't you under stress? But it didn't occur to me until about a month later when I ended up back at the hospital, what was actually happening and how brilliant his questions actually were. So at the time, I was diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. And what had been happening, which I didn't realize, was I had been having anxiety attacks, rather small ones, not panic attacks that, that would be obvious to somebody watching me, but these small anxiety attacks that were affecting my sleep or affecting my diet, affecting the way I lived my life, affecting my physical health, and so since then, since 2007, I've been on this personal journey to deal with this anxiety disorder. And through that, I've spent years now examining my own cognitive biases, my cognitive distortions, cognitive dissonance, fallacies that I am more prone to because of these things. Um, and it's been this really incredible, challenging journey but I think it's given me the kind of insight that maybe people who don't have something like an anxiety disorder don't often think about. So I have to challenge myself constantly, you know, why am I thinking what I'm thinking? Why do I believe what I believe? 
because I know that I have certain triggers where maybe an average person wouldn't ever have those thoughts, would not ever think critically about why they are thinking something or why they are behaving a certain way. So that has been really powerful for me. So what you're saying is that the training that you received and how to understand human thinking has really been what has helped you to cope with your own anxiety triggers, with your own stressors. Right. So I've had my own personal therapy that has given me great insight. And then I've had the training at the agency that has given me insight into other people. And really, the training at the agency is based around how you can manipulate people's vulnerabilities. And so when you combine those two things, it's this really powerful perspective on the human brain, on how humans think and feel and make decisions, how humans can be influenced. Um, So I think the combination of my own personal journey, in addition to all of the training we received at the agency about how to recruit an asset and how to convince them to spy for, you know, for our country, um, that has all combined to be a lot of um, really powerful knowledge for me. So how does all this jive with your social working center? (laughs) Are you helping people when you're manipulating people? Have you found a way to bridge that gap or rationalize that truth? How does that play out in your trained, experienced mind? So I think manipulation has, there's, it's two sides of a coin, and I, which you and I discussed when you began Everyday Spy, when you began Everyday Espionage in the very beginning. I remember. Was that, you know, are you manipulating somebody or are you motivating somebody? So when I was at the agency, it was a constant, ongoing assessment of how do I feel about the cases that I'm working? What are some things, you know, I had my own red lines of things that I would never suggest or people that I would have, you know, maybe would be a target, but I would have in-depth discussions about, you know, how to go about meeting that person and becoming friends with them and getting them to spy for us. Because there's, you know, there's a devious way you can do things, right. and then there's a more humanistic way you can do things. And so I just tried to lean towards the way that made me the most comfortable. Um, and then coming out of the agency, I still have the perspective that, you know, sometimes people need a push. Sometimes people need a hand. Sometimes those things come in one bundle, a push and a hand. So I love that you had the idea to do Everyday Spy because you're taking everything we've learned and applying it in a positive way where we know from personal experience that that can also be applied in a negative way, but we are choosing not to do so. And we're in a position where we don't have to do those things. Right. Those are not the skills that are constructive skills. Correct. When we talk about the hand versus the push, when we talk about carrots versus sticks, when you talk about manipulation versus motivation... We have seen firsthand how powerful both can be, but really what the risk that you run with manipulation is that there is a shelf life for manipulation. As soon as you take the pressure off, as soon as the matrix or the rubric changes for what that person cares about or doesn't care about, when you lose that manipulative leverage, you lose the person. And losing the person also can become that person becoming a threat to you because of what they know about you and about your tactics in manipulation. It's the same reason why in any given relationship, once somebody lies to you or cheats on you, they've lost your trust. It's why when you see people who connive or see people who stab others in the back to get ahead, you don't trust them again. That manipulative tactic is very limited. And I feel like too often we think that it's a tool that we can use for immediate or short-term success without long-term risk, and it's not that at all. The flip side of the coin, like you said, that motivational lever instead, when you help people to achieve what they're trying to achieve, you are ingratiating them to trust you and want to be with you and want to collaborate with you because they will forever see you as a solution to their problems. And when we talk to Edie Savage, and I know you know Edie Savage, and Mm -hmm. um, I know that you are just as impressed by her and intimidated by her (laughs) (laughs) as I am, but she has a, a great way of talking about the benefits of helping people because it is exponentially beneficial 
long into the future when you wouldn't even be able to anticipate it being valuable. It's when the second and third generation of villager or the second and third generation of extremist is just predisposed to supporting and working with you because you were there to help them build a school or you were there to help them build a hospital or your hospital helped save their mother from malaria and they will never forget the value that the Americans placed in you know, helping their liberated country. These are such powerful motivations. And it's why I believe that something like Everyday Spy, if we're going to dedicate our lives to building a business, it should be a business that makes things better. So it's very powerful to me to hear you support it like that, especially since you didn't always support the idea of us having our own business. (laughs) Well, when you had the initial idea of renting out bouncy houses to children's birthday parties. <laughs> I did not <laughs> support that idea. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> I did once have a bouncy house business idea. That is also correct. Yes. You know, there are people out there who are making a killing off of that still. I, I just know don't know how are. they did it. <laughs> Those are some smarter people than me. <laughs> they, maybe they had a supportive wife. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Touche. So I want to go back to talk about your anxiety for a second because we've left the agency. And I remember when we were at the agency, you had to travel, I had to travel, we had our first child, we still had to travel, and every time travel came up, it was a stressor because you were going to be gone, I couldn't always know where you were going, you didn't always get to know where I was going, we had all sorts of childcare issues in between with work hours and work locations, etc. When we left the agency, we had the opportunity to leave all that travel stress behind, but we didn't. Instead, we basically built Everyday Spy as a digital work front, a digital business, and now we just travel for fun. We travel all the time. We've been traveling full time since December of 2018. It's not gotten any less stressful. The travel and the anxiety still affects you. So why do you do it? I question myself every month, (laughs) about once a month. I ask myself, do I really want to be traveling like this? But inevitably, the answer is always yes. I have wanderlust. I was raised by a family that traveled a lot, not in a military sense and probably not in a traditional American sense, but I was born overseas I lived overseas until I was six, and then every summer we would travel to uh, visit my grandmother who lived in Venezuela and visit family members there. So we were constantly surrounded by people who traveled a lot, who immigrated to the United States, whom we traveled ourselves, and you know, my mom would save up her money. I mean, <laughs> I didn't do Girl Scouts because my mom said that she needed to save her money so we could take a trip every summer. And sure enough, every summer we traveled somewhere, whether in in the United States or outside. So I just have it ingrained in me that I want to see the world. I want to have new experiences. I want to hear new languages, eat new food, meet new people, learn the culture of the world. And I really feel like that helps me understand myself in America better. So when we lived in Bangkok, you basically had a panic attack that had you borderline bed riddled for two or three days. Yes. And when we moved to Abu Dhabi, you went through about, well, what would have probably been five or six days of panic attack, but you didn't have that option because you had to start fulfilling a contract right away. Correct. And now we're talking about moving again. And it's for us, as we speak, it's the tail end of the Corona crisis. Borders all over the world are still closed. Where we had planned to go was New Zealand, but New Zealand is basically talking about holding its borders closed until they've eradicated a virus that you and I don't believe will ever be eradicated. So we know that our New Zealand plan is basically going to fall through in the short run. So now here we are pressed up against an edge. Where are we going to go? How are we going to keep traveling? Oh, and by the way, we have no idea what life is going to look like when we start traveling again. Are we going to be put in quarantine in whatever country we land in? If so, will that quarantine be comfortable or uncomfortable? What's it going to look like? Just as I go through this, I can see the stress on your face. What makes the travel worth it? What makes the travel worth being so ill and so stressed? And why do you do it still? 
It's worth it to me because the discomfort is temporary. So we tend to travel in a way where it's longer term travel. So if I'm down and out for three days because I'm having an anxiety attack, then I know that I am have the rest of the month to explore. I have another six months to explore, however long we've decided to be there. And that those three days in the very beginning, number one, I'm anticipating those happening so I can put things in place to help mitigate that. I can make sure that I have some support because my biggest concern is always I have an anxiety attack. I have to take care of the kids. So when we moved to Bangkok, I didn't have any children and I was lucky enough to have friends on the other side that helped me. But I make sure that I have some support in place so I can take care of my responsibilities and I can take care of myself. I use a meditation app. I do all kinds of things that help me through those first few days where my anxiety spikes and I know that over time it will dissipate. I don't have my wife's anxiety. I don't have her worries. I don't have her fears and I don't have her uncertainty. But the fact that she confronts them every day, even while I do not, shows me that I also do not have her courage. Fear and uncertainty hold people back from incredible possibilities. And while CIA trained Jihee and I to overcome our own mental limitations, we have seen how everyday people are paralyzed by the unknown all the time. They get frozen in their career, frozen in bad relationships, frozen in their business decisions because of choices and worries and expectations. But in that doubt, you and I have the opportunity to show courage and reap the benefits of a world without limits. That is Everyday Espionage. Everyday Espionage is dedicated to one thing educating everyday people. I know that not everyone will listen, but those who listen will learn. If you learned something new today, click subscribe, review, and share the podcast with a friend. Find me on social media at Everyday Spy or on my website, everydayspy.com. If you are up for a special challenge, visit everydayspy.com forward slash operations and join me for an authentic spy training mission. And above all else, remember that knowledge is freedom.